good morning uh, to those of you who are on the East Coast. Good evening to Mary, who's in uh, Thailand right now. Um, I am ecstatic, uh, nervous, uh, very much excited about this conversation, which I've been looking forward to, not just for the past couple of weeks as we've been planning it, but really having been an admirer of Mary's work for over a decade now. Um, my name is Jeremy Menchik. I'm an associate professor in the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. Um, I'm with, of course, Professor Mary Callahan, who's an associate professor in the Jackson School at the University of Washington. We're going to be having a conversation today about mass movements and state violence in Myanmar. Um, I want to start with uh, just a very brief introduction of Professor Callahan. Um, and then uh, I'm going to ask Professor Callahan where she is now and why. We'll then dig into about a half hour of uh, questions from me based on my students' input, um, as well as existing conversations with Professor Callahan. And then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience because we have a big audience, which is wonderful. If you have a question for Professor Callahan, you can drop it in the chat directly. You can also send it to, if you'd like, if you prefer for security reasons to send it as a private message to BU Pardee School. Um, we will then be reviewing those questions and asking them of Professor Callahan. Um, and I'll devote as much time as I can to audience questions because I know there's a lot of desire to learn from her today. Um, so for those who don't know, Professor Callahan is a really uh, one of the world's leading scholars of the military in Myanmar with a particular expertise in authoritarianism, in social movements, in regime durability. Um, she's the author of many articles and book chapters. Uh, there's the John Stewart moment. Um, she's the author <laughs> of Making Enemies, uh, War and State Building in Burma. Uh, which is an indispensable text. It really remains the, the most highly cited, the most important text on the military in Myanmar. Um, so hers is an absolutely indispensable voice and I'm thrilled that we all get to learn from her today. Um, so before we dig in, there's something that Mary wanted to start with to, to say to our audience. Yeah, thank you um, to the Party School for setting this up, um, for the kind invitation and for caring about the people of Myanmar. Um, I think that we have to begin with the recognition of the bravery, generosity, intelligence, and creativity of the resistance forces of all kinds in Myanmar. Um, and I think I, we also have to acknowledge the privileged position Jeremy and I hold, um, but especially me. I have been so privileged, I, I mean honored, uh, most of all by the friends, acquaintances, academics, public intellectuals, former students, uh, community members and leaders, um, and others who are Myanmar citizens who have done nothing but help me for 30 years. Um, but I also recognize um, quite painfully that I hold a US passport. And this is the fifth time that I have been able to flee danger in protests and crackdowns inside the country and escape to a safer place. Um, not an option for the people of Myanmar. And for 30 years, I've also had unimaginably valuable access to the immense resources of spectacular libraries and brilliant librarians at Cornell University and the University of Washington, as well as archives outside the country. Um, so please understand that I would never pretend to speak for the Myanmar people as their voices are vibrant and much more important. I speak only from the experiences and studies I have had the immense privilege to undertake. Thank you. Um, we're gonna talk more about um, privilege and what we in uh, the comfort of, of Boston or Ithaca or um, anywhere uh, else can do to support people who are struggling for human rights and democracy. Um, I want to start, however, with where are you, Mary, and, and why? Uh, you've spent 30 years uh, working, researching, studying in Myanmar. You're not there now. Tell us a little bit about why. Yeah, I'm in Thailand, and I'm wrapping up uh, 10 days of quarantine. Um, this was really hard. Uh, I had vowed not to leave again 
um, as late as March 27th, the Armed Forces Day of Shame, in which um, more than 100 un people, unarmed civilians, were murdered by security forces. Um, even the week before, when two thoroughly legitimate foreign business people who had done nothing but try to help the country were detained at the airport upon their attempted departure, I still couldn't picture myself boarding a plane. But on the 27th, not only were dozens of inhumanely cruel killings documented by citizen journalists, but the Air Force strafed the villages of Northern Karen State, where many protesters on the run were being sheltered by the Karen National Union, a signatory to a now failed peace process. To me, that meant the military would use any and all of its combat weaponry, even if it meant destroying the country in the process. No one, including me, is safe there. And that is the situation in Yangon now. Thank you. So that, uh, that willingness by the military to burn the country to the ground that's not new, right? In your 2003 book, you documented that the uh, astonishing and in some ways unique durability of military authoritarianism in Myanmar was a product of the period of state formation where the military, because of the complete um, uh, decimation of political institutions in the post-colonial period, the military uh, wound up doing banal things like tax collection, uh, food distribution, census taking. Um, uh, that has been really crucial for our understanding of extraordinary military, durable military authoritarianism in Myanmar. Now your book was published in 2003, okay? So it's almost 20 years later. A lot has changed, but probably some things haven't changed. So. Um, I guess the, the question is, um, are the military and the state still so intertwined? Yeah, um, very poignant questions, Jeremy. And <laughs> to be honest, it might take me another 210 pages to answer. Um, and, uh, to, and also to be frank, I, I very much wish that book was no longer relevant. Um, but let me try to offer a couple of points here about what uh, we see uh, unfolding in MIMA. Um, one about, uh, I'll come to the differentiation or, or intertwine, uh, intertwining of military and state in a second. But let me first just kind of lay out the scenario of what's happening. So the current counterinsurgency campaign against the resistance is being carried out by very specific units, a combination of lone team or riot police and frontline soldiers who have been redeployed from conflict zones in more remote ethnic nationality areas. In both those kinds of units, live combat and extreme oppression have been the route for officer promotion that careers are still made in 2021 or in the making only via uh, seeing civilians as uh, not as rights bearing citizens, but as enemies of the state and therefore a legitimate target of deadly violence. That suggests that despite generational change over time in the officer corps and other ranks, Nothing has changed in the Army's core war fighting machine, the light infantry and the riot police. Now to the question of how intertwined the state and the military are, I mean, to the Army's immense disadvantage as it moves forward, the military and the state have been dis differentiated over the last 10 years under the terms of the 2008 constitution in many ways. But let me mention a couple. First, um, the Army used to control the state either by assigning active duty personnel, uh, but mostly by pensioning off unpromotable officers to managerial positions in the bureaucracy. And that's brilliantly chronicled by Yoshihiro, Yoshihiro Nakanishi in a book called Strong Soldiers Failed Revolution. 
that practice stopped 10 years ago. And so now you have a civilianized bureaucracy, much less loyal to the Tamarok and willing to join the civil disobedience movement. More importantly, uh, uh, the other reason uh, that this differentiation hurts the military right now is that local administration in, in cities, the, the most local unit is called the ward and in rural areas, it's village. Local administration, while still managed in some parts of the country by retired army officers, is now a much more mixed picture than even several years ago. My ward official, for example, beginning February 6th, took all of the office's furniture down a long block to a major thoroughfare where he stood on the desk on the sidewalk and used the ward megaphone to shout protests against the coup to heavy traffic that all slowed to honor his performance. It will not be easy for the military to rebuild local ward and village offices in communities where there are now highly motivated people who know a dozen different ways to either take down the office or any army appointee. Thank you. So let me follow up on that point, Mary. Um, that's one way, right? Local level control, political control, um, as well as more civilians in the bureaucracy. That's one thing that, that is different from the past 20 years. Another thing that is different is civil society, right? The 2008 constitution really did provide a moment for a flourishing of uh, civil rights organizations, women's organizations, press and media. Local media has absolutely thrived in the past decade. Tell me about the impact of that thriving civil society, which is different from the history of other periods of military authoritarianism. What is that gonna mean for the durability of, 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 of this period of military authoritarianism that we appear to be going into? Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated question to answer. So um, it is absolutely the case that since President Thane Sane's uh, initial inauguration speech at the end of March 2011, uh, we saw such rapid changes. Uh, the, the release of 2,000 politi political prisoners, the opening, the, uh, the closure of the censorship board, the uh, allowance of non-state uh, daily media, um, and followed by uh, MEMA going online uh, when a very legitimate telecoms tender process was undertaken and two foreign telecoms actors came in with the condition that uh, SIM cards cost $1. Um, and you know, you can, you can get a Chinese smartphone um, uh, for 10 or $15 in Myanmar. So, um, so Myanmar went online and, and to a large extent, a lot of these kids who now are the core of the protesters grew up in an environment where they uh, didn't carry the baggage that all previous generations did. The immense distrust of, of that comes from living under authoritarianism and, and in particular the military has, when it did rule until 2011, it practiced a kind of randomness and arbitrariness um, in its enforcement of, of laws that meant you never knew if something you were doing would be called illegal. Um, and so this generation grew up without all of that. Um, uh, and so they don't, uh, the Gen Z kids really don't, uh, see uh, uh, a loss or a defeat as possible because that's just not in their world to, to go back to what their parents lived through. Many of the kids that I've talked to on the street, um, they didn't realize how much their parents had suffered 
um, and how, how tragic uh, one generation after another, um, how, how, how tragic their outlooks were. Um, you know, there's just lost generations in Myanmar because of, of the insanity of military rule. So um, I think that, uh, that society is a completely different place than the military thinks it is. Um, uh, and uh, one of the problems is that uh, the way in which uh, opening up to the world and opening up even just movement inside the country, you know, Myanmar people taking vacations in other parts of the country. Um, uh, all of that uh, has led to a, a major uh, set of cultural and social changes um, that the military has not aligned with. I mean, so as one colleague often says, society has changed much faster than uh, military culture. Thank you. One way in which we see that change um, is the continued dominance of the National League for Democracy, the NLD, at the ballot box, 2012 in the by-election, 2015 and 2020 in the national elections. Um, you know, it's given the military's reserve seats, 25% uh, reserve seats um, in the parliament um, that has truncated the impact that the NLD has been able to push forward for reforms. Um, but uh, from the outside, uh, you know, the military has, hasn't been happy with their performance in the ballot box, but they put a decade and a half into building what seemed like from the outside, a pretty stable hybrid regime, right? So if we use indicators from varieties of democracy project or the polity indicators, you know, since 2011, there's been this tremendous expansion of some liberal rights, right? Without becoming a full democracy. Um, and you had what seemed like from the outside a stable hybrid regime, okay, which is a remarkably common form of government around the world. Why did the military throw that away? Why did the 2020 elections or what else is going on behind the scenes that caused them to say, you know what, this 15 year experiment wasn't working? Yeah, um, it, that's the question that, that a graduate student 20 years from now would We'll have to find um, some archives to figure out the answer to, um, because you know, in so many ways, the military was in the catbird seat. It retained veto power over constitutional reform, full autonomy over internal affairs, and some, but not all, of its economic advantages. Um, at some point in the future, we may find some archival evidence that this coup was long planned. Um, but more likely, I think in hindsight, we'll see some longer term structural causes uh, that have to do with the relationship between the military um, and society. And then within society, the immense inequality, uh, the, the dogged discrimination uh, the, that continues to exist in Myanmar and class conflict um, probably created to some degree an environment for this violence. Um, but for now, I just wanna point one thing out um, that I don't think the media has picked up on much. Um, and that's, I wanna just point out what I would call the Napidaw effect, um, which has uh, demonstrably undermined the military's ability to understand the immense social, cultural and economic changes that have occurred um, and are in fact fueling this resistance. So just a little bit of background, if I can, Jeremy, in the weeds. Um, the transfer of the Yangon-based government, uh, where the former junta was based, um, to this remote new capital in the middle of the country was announced uh, unexpectedly and precipitously on November 6, 2005. Um, with dump trucks showing up the next day at many government offices to pick up the staff 
uh, and carry them uh, a hundred and some odd miles uh, off into the wilderness. They didn't take most of the ledgers and files of ministries. Um, and they moved these people into an incompleted capital, which had neither adequate housing for the staff nor any schools for their children to attend. Now, there's a great article by Andrew Self in which he goes through 11 reasons for the move to Napidaw. And, but the timing of the move seems almost certainly to have been determined by an astrologer to the former commander in chief. Now, official sources today say the population of Napidaw is a million, but I don't think so. Um, and that means that both the civilian government and the military high command, which also relocated to Nipido, no longer live where most Myanmar people do. Given the extremely hierarchical nature of political power in Myanmar, over the last 10 years, as culture and society has changed dramatically, Napido's hierarchy only let in bad news for a few of the years under President thing, maybe 2011 to mid 2014. And arguably since then, nobody in either the civilian or military leadership wanted to hear any bad news. Um, and in all likelihood, the ongoing animosity of the population toward the military, which partly accounts for the mass massive landslide uh, by the NLD in last year's election. It ran on a platform, vote for us and the military comes back. Um, that that um, the animosity would never have been recognized or reported by the sources upon which the commander in chief relied for both personal and political uh, uh, career planning. I think a year ago, Mao Lime was convinced he'd be president. Um, he uh, would have likely attended quarterly meetings with regional commanders uh, who um, probably were reporting accurately that the populations in their areas of operation were complaining about their NLD MPs, were angry that the NLD never delivered anything on the peace process. And especially in the last year, in the COVID-affected economy, there was not enough help from the NLD government to those devastated by job loss, um, the contraction of export markets, and the loss of foreign remittances. So I think a highly plausible scenario is that he would then have had to believe that the election was deeply flawed based on the intel he had been given. Um, that, that the only way the NLD could have won by such a landslide was by cheating. And he would have expected the population would welcome a steadying hand. Nothing could have been farther from their actual response. Thank you, Mary. That is an important story that hasn't been told outside of Myanmar. And I, in some ways, it's a familiar one to those of us who are students of James Scott in the audience, mm -hmm. Southeast Asianists, right? It's a twin story of the high expectations of, of new capitals and that high modernist knowledge that mm -hmm. leads one to think that they can start over afresh and the, the extreme ignorance at the height of power about local knowledge um, right. that's familiar to those of us in the US who are just ending, you know, four years. under a Trump administration where only some news has, has, has gotten out. Um, I wanna shift gears to talk about um, that, as you say, uh, the anger uh, towards, towards the military, uh, the deep resentment in society. I wanna hear more about the resistance. Um, uh, we've seen really heroic po portraits, um, international media, um, Instagram uh, in particular um, has, you know, has shown to the world these portraits of the resistance, but it's hard for those of us on the outside to see the aggregate picture, right? Is the resistance in urban areas, rural areas, young people, old people, supporters of the NLD? Is there an ethnic dimension? Give us a big picture as much as one can at this stage of what the resistance to military authoritarianism looks like. 
Sure. Um, there are a few exceptions, which I'm happy to answer in the Q&A. Um, but in general, the coup has united a pretty uh, long-term, deeply divided population in ways nothing else really has, possibly even since uh, the World War II, excuse me, the World War II anti-Japanese resistance. Um, in my neighborhood, as I said, even the authorities were out on the first day of protests, young and old, urban and rural areas, some days as many as 40 towns and villages, um, ethnic nationalities in some parts of the country, but not necessarily in all, um, religious groups and leaders of all denominations, men and women, as well as the LGBTQ community were represented in full force. Um, at the very outset, we saw daily negotiated settlements uh, between the riot police um, and the lead leaders of the individual protests um, in which uh, their joyful end of the world singing crowds uh, would agree to disperse um, peacefully. That only lasted three to four days um, and was followed by an the occasional use of force over the next week, um, which began with rubber bullets on February 8th um, and inevitably led to the first death of what are that are being called the fallen heroes, Mia Tsuipe Kain, who died after being on life support on February 19th, after being hit in an earlier rally with live ammunition and Nipida. So just to give you a little flavor, I lived right next to a um, what surprisingly turned out to be a large-ish uh, protest camp. Um, and I uh, went out every day and talked to the protesters um, and saw the discourse change dramatically at a few inflection points. For example, after the extent of an all-day use of automatic weapons and grenades for the first time on March 3rd in North Okalapa, against these totally peaceful protesters. Um, and subsequently, North Okalapa, which is a satellite town created after the 1958 coup, uh, it was subsequently put under martial law. And March 3rd is when the younger social media savvy kids in my neighborhood began fashioning homemade defensive weapons. But then after the March 14th slaughter in the peri-urban slum outside of Yangon called Hlang Dayan, um, initially reported as 18 dead, but I don't think we'll ever know how many people died. Um, then my neighborhood's group began fashioning Molotov cocktails out of things as amazing as Red Bull cans and the chicken egg shells. Uh, that they collected as, and they also learned how to make their first IEDs. Let's, um, let's keep talking about those tactics, Mary. Um, you know, I, I'm teaching a social movements class and we've been in awe of the innovation um, that the resistance has, has, has undertaken, spray painting pictures of the generals on the ground to try to slow down the military, um, the flashlight strike, um, the, the, this is a new year um, that we're coming up on, the flower festival strike, um, the three finger salute in solidarity with uh, protests in Hong Kong. Um, and in Thailand, I know you've been categorizing these tactics too. Um, what other innovation have you you've seen? What can social movements around the world learn from the incredible innovation that's happening in Myanmar now? Yeah, I mean, it's almost impossible to describe the in amazing ingenuity of these hundreds of cells of protesters all over the country or almost all over the country. Um, I would say that we've seen well over a few hundred identifiable tactical innovations in the last two and a half months. They started from um, the initial standard MIMA street protests 
and the Hong Kong inspired um, Hunger Games salute. But then they moved uh, relatively soon into the invocation of some of the most culturally and religious, religiously sensitive maneuvers one could imagine, highly specific to the country or region. So one was what you mentioned, um, the, so stealthily at night, despite the curfew, uh, the protest groups uh, went out and glued pictures of the commander in chief all over the street in between where they planned to set up their protest and where early on uh, the soldiers were actually sleeping in their trucks. Um, so that would mean that the soldiers would have to step on the face uh, or the head uh, of the commander in chief, which is culturally immensely taboo. Another was the hanging of women's longis or sarongs um, between the security forces and positions and that of the protesters. They were hung on ropes that, that were up very high. And there is a long standing and widespread belief in Myanmar. And to be honest, this is true even among some of my most feminist Myanmar friends, that if men walk under the apparel of women, they will lose their poem, roughly translated as power. I mean, you could write a book on what poem means, but roughly they're power or their masculinity. Um, now we are seeing the security forces facing on any given day, 30 to 60 different tactics in different parts of the country. Um, the last couple of days have seen, as you mentioned, Jeremy, um, people uh, emerge in flash protests in some areas, but more importantly, during the usual frenetic celebration of the Buddhist New Year, the tactic has been largely silent, which is illustrative of the unbelievable exercises of discipline among the protest ranks. It is so hard for Burmese people not to celebrate the new year. Um, and that is set against the state media, which portrays everything as completely normal and calm, um, but the streets everywhere in Buddhist Myanmar are now empty when they should be the most overrun. That is, um, it's impressive self-control and restraint. Yeah. Uh, sometimes silence uh, is, is, is more powerful than the banging of pots and pans and noise and disruption. Um, it's, it's remarkable innovation and heroism. Um, before we open to the floor to the question, Mary, we have to talk about the killings. Um, we should talk about it head on. Um, the estimates are now were uh, upwards of 714 people who have been killed. Um, two days ago, um, you said on the BBC that there's been mortar fire um, in, in, in Bago, uh, grenades. Who's being killed? Who's being targeted? Why? Yeah, I mean, I I think the military had existing lists and is developing more on the fly. Um, so there's two things that really concern me. Um, first is that in every community, including my neighborhood, there is this hard to suppress uh, kind of muscle memory. Um, it's a suspicion that the army is using its age old practice uh, of raiding a neighborhood. There are so many nighttime raids, uh, chilling nighttime raids in my neighborhood. Um, and what they do is they take random civilians, usually men or boys, but sometimes women or girls, and they hold them hostage to get their families to inform on who is who in the neighborhood. And so this is lingering in every community, I think. Um, and then the second is that the army is using Facebook almost diabolically wow. to get uh, to add to their list every night. So every night at 8 p.m., 8 p.m. Mass, state TV news announces a new list. I, I think last night was 20, I haven't seen tonight, um, of people identified via their posts and their details of their Facebook profiles. All are charged with section 505-A as amended to, by the junta. And this is the part of the British colonial era penal code still in existence. 
that covers the crime called incitement. Now, even before the coup, it was already illegal to um, publish or circulate any, quote, statement, rumor, or report, unquote, with the intent to cause, um, and this is all I'm reading from the law, uh, or which is likely to cause, any officer, soldier, sailor, or airman in the Army, Navy, or Air Force to mutiny or otherwise disregard or fail in his duty. The amendment by the junta made it illegal, punishable by three years in jail, to utter in any way the words coup, junta, or civil disobedience movement. 8 p.m. is important because that is precisely the start of curfew. So everyone now has to tune in to what otherwise would be an ignored state newscast on TV every night. They have to sit through the insane propaganda until the list is revealed. And all the while they're praying they're not on it because you can't run away after eight o'clock because of the curfew. Scholars of civil war tell us that there's oftentimes, and I'm using the word civil war uh, deliberately as you've uh, started doing over the past week or so, um, where the killing seems to be escalating. The political science definition of a civil war is a thousand battle deaths. And unfortunately, it seems like we'll, we'll hit that, that mark uh, by the end of the month. Scholars of civil war say there's a logic, right? There's a particular regions uh, of the country where these nighttime raids are happening? Um, are there people specifically targeted because of their Facebook posts? Is this episodic or is there some overarching strategy here? Yeah, I, mean, I suspect um, that in the minds of, of those who are giving the orders, um, there is, but I. I honestly, I'm, I can't even hazard a guess at, at what seems like the same old military pattern of using randomness and arbitrariness to the violence. Um, and uh, back in prior to 2011, um, that arbitrary nature of enforcement um, led to to a very atomized society in which people knew where the red lines were, they self-censored and they carried out immense self-discipline. Um, and in when the killings go this way, no one is safe. Um, and my only other response to this question is a reminder, um, just from the violence in Bago, a town near Yangon, um, in which it's been reported that more than 80 people were killed on a single day on April 7th, we know that hundreds of people remain missing. And that's probably true all over the country. Um, are they dead? Are they in hiding? Are they in detention? Are they in Thailand? Can the families get the bodies? Can the crematoriums keep up? Um, it's, I mean, it's just a horrifying um, situation. Okay, but before we open up to questions, um, I want to end on um, a slightly more empowering note. Um, the parallels with the Syrian civil war are are, are hard not to see. Um, you know, uh, we are on the verge of humanitarian disaster if it hasn't already begun. Um, massive killings. Um, and uh, all that compounded by COVID-19. Um, and so we should be expecting some sort of refugee crisis um, to, to, to begin relatively soon. But you're talking, Mary, to a pretty privileged audience uh, in Boston and, 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 and around the world, or many, many people who are listening. Uh, what can we do uh, to decrease the suffering? Um, what, can, uh, what are the strategies for international solidarity uh, with, with people on the ground? Yeah, um, let me start with with a kind of standard tool, um, which is doable wherever you are, um, which is naming, shaming, and keeping up. 
Um, I mean, I think a major effort should be underway to capture any and all social media posts and any other communications that could eventually constitute evidence for an accountability mechanism. The more of us doing this, the better. Uh, the second thing I would say is if you have any friends inside Myanmar or Myanmar friends uh, helping people inside the country, Myanmar friends who might be outside of the country, now is the time to ask them for advice on what you should do and then you need to follow through. Um, on Twitter, follow what's the hashtag what's happening in Myanmar. Um, expand the Facebook pages you follow to include Burmese language ones. Uh, Facebook's translation tool is still a work in progress, um, but given the resources Facebook is devoting to Myanmar, I would expect it to get much better very fast. Um, please engage with people posting about their achievements in resistance and the horrors they face. Um, what continues to amaze me is that people in Myanmar fear being forgotten or ignored by the world even more than they fear a bullet. Um, in terms of the international community, um, you know, I, I think the best we could hope for is an attempt to bring about de-escalation, but even that is, the international community is ill-suited for this, um, as this, this poor country um, has proven over and over again um, in, in the failure of the international community to help the people. Um, de-escalation is probably only achievable um, in, in the hands of Myanmar's neighbors, Thailand and China, and maybe to some extent Russia. So of course, now we, we have China and Russia uh, on the Security Council, uh, UN Security Council, and they consistently block any really significant action by the Security Council. And I think the problem is that neither of the two important neighbors, Thailand or China, are domestically in a place where they could take on the kind of nuanced, urgent, and probably extremely expensive intervention that would be necessary, nor do either of them have the political will. So now I think in the privileged world that we're speaking to, now is the time for the world to prepare for life-saving interventions. I don't think any longer we can say if there's going to be a greater humanitarian catastrophe than already exists in many of the border regions, but now it's when. And um, so we are now at a crossroads uh, uh, that in which it is time to dig back into, into history and into uh, some of the really useful policy and academic studies of how you operate in an absolutely impossible uh, 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 political environment. Um, if we see uh, the continuation of the contraction of the economy, which is estimated by one consultancy firm to have con contracted by at least 20% uh, last year um, due to the uh, COVID global situation, um, and also COVID probably spreading in Myanmar. Um, but uh, right now, um, people are on the edge of desperation. So I just wanna say if there are any Myanmar listeners, I know this is not what you wanna hear and I'm very sorry and heartbroken um, that this is, this is how I see things. Um, I would love to be wrong, and I've been wrong many times in the past. Um, and so just as an example, I was in Jakarta, Indonesia in May 1998, when the protests erupted over the military assassinations at Trisakti University. Um, never in a million years did I think it would lead to some of the gruesome violence that would result, but I also never thought it would lead to the fall of Suharto. Um, so I really hope to be wrong here. Majimbade, as I would say in Burmese. 
I'm going to open um, the floor to some questions. There's a lot coming in. If people have questions, feel free to, to send them my way. Um, first, from Christina. Mary, you mentioned uh, that ethnic unity um, was the case, um, excuse me, has been the case for the resistance. Um, historically, that was the case in the late 1980s and 1988, protests against the Tatma Dalvao then, um, but the military very skillfully fractured uh, the resistance along ethnic lines. Under what conditions are we likely to see continued unity? Under what conditions might we, we, we see some sort of fracture along ethnic lines again? Yeah, so Christina, I think I know this Christina, um, I um, understand uh, the tone of your question. So um, I am not making a case that there is ethnic unity. I mean, for example, in Rakhine State in Sitwe, they are celebrating the, the um, water festival as though nothing is wrong. Um, so um, uh, we, I would say that what we do see now um, is a moment of solidarity, which is not the same thing as unity. Um, and we've seen it before in 2007 and 1988, where ethnic and to some degree religious boundaries were broken down against a common enemy, meaning the army. Um, but they only got rebuilt because of everyone's lack of trust, uh, inability to communicate across languages, uh, problems ingrained over 70 years of civil war and at least 50 years of terribly repressive life-threatening governance. And as um, you mentioned, the longstanding tactics by the military to divide and rule are, are cheap and effective. Um, so these very clever protests, and um, I think the rhetorically impressive statements of solidarity by the Bama Buddhist majority, um, understanding that they need to have a federal solution in some ways, um, those actually have to be backed up with real and concrete recognition of the differential suffering between the heartland and the conflict areas. In the remote ethnic areas, people have experienced what is happening in the center now on a daily basis, on and off for at least 50 years. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, over the last 10 years during the kind of fairy tale narrative of, of a transition to democracy, it was possible to have a huge friend group in Yangon among Myanmar people and have no idea that villages, not necessarily even that far away, but decisively in non-Burmese speaking territory, were being hit with cluster bombs and fragmentation grenades all the time. It wouldn't have registered for all but a small percentage of the central majority population. Thank you. Um, keep the questions coming. Um, we have one from uh, Professor Weiss. Um, good to hear from you, Meredith. She says, I'm wondering about the CRPH alternative government. Do they still have access to significant resources or are they mostly limited to external efforts? Um, uh, are the anti-coup ward leaders that you mentioned, are they still formally within the administration? I think here we're trying to get a sense of within the bureaucracy, uh, is there the potential for resistance uh, or are these local ad hoc, discreet and likely not to, to lead to significant pressure on the re regime. Likewise, the CRPH, is there a proactive agenda or is everyone, uh, including the NLD, just playing defense at this point? Um, so I would like to think um, that we will see something come out from the CRPH. It's, it's called the Committee representing the Pidanzu Flito, uh, which was formed after, after uh, the MPs, they all, the NLD MPs and other MPs all lived in a particular guest house in Lepido. Um, it was formed after the initial, initial shock wore off. Um, but it's, it, it was 
formed at the beginning with 70 of the 1100 MPs elected at all levels last November. And they've, they've taken an oath of office. Um, and they're fashioning what is being called a national unity government. Um, some of the CRPH uh, members um, are Bama Buddhists uh, who truly believe what they are saying about uh, the importance to take ethnic perspectives into account and to break down the walls of discrimination. And that wasn't an easy sell under the NLD government. I mean, but here I would say um, manage expectations uh, because the CRPH is mostly NLD. And one of the things that is, is poignantly felt in the ethnic minority or ethnic nationality areas is the, the memory of the November 8th uh, election last year. The NLD beginning at, in early October uh, with a speech by the uh, campaign chief, Dr. Zomimon, decided its greatest threat were ethnic political parties. And it ran on an explicitly anti-ethnic political party platform. Um, and these ethnic political parties had spent three years preparing for this election, merging like multiple Kachin parties, multiple Karen parties into single ethnicity parties. It worked so hard, they had vetted and, and compromised on so many candidates and all those candidates lost uh, demonstrably. Um, so who exactly is gonna join the NLD in that government that is considered a legitimate representative of, of an ethnic group or religious group. Um, I, I think there are some real challenges. In terms of um, administrative uh, issues, I think the military has a huge problem. Um, these local ward offices contain the only reliable records uh, and there, even those aren't that great, but the only reliable records of who lives where, you know, famously the British uh, uh, made everything about pinning people down to, to addresses. Um, and that got kept up uh, with this um, administration uh, system that's based on household lists. Um, some of these ward offices have been torched, a big one in a multi-ethnic area in Yangon called Munigon, uh, was burned to the ground in broad daylight at two o'clock in the afternoon recently. Um, there, without those records, I don't know how the military uh, rolls. And I also don't know what who you put in there. I mean, you send a junior officer, a non-commissioned officer in to, to take over a ward administration when, when there's a bunch of people who know how to hurt you and um, blow up your office. I mean, it's, it's going to be very difficult to govern. And I think that's part of the resistance strategy is to make the country ungovernable. So that segues into a question I'm getting from multiple sources um, about uh, defections and yeah. splits within the military. So I think we want to tackle that that head on. You know, the case of the People Power Revolution in the Philippines, in the case of um, Egypt's um, 2011 revolution, splits in the military were absolutely essential. We've seen some defections. Uh, and there was a story uh, just yesterday from the Times of, uh, of, of Britain uh, from a, a junior defector who claimed that, quote, 75% of soldiers were in fact opposed to the coup. So that raises the possibility of, of defections. Tell us about the possibilities for split within the military, how to interpret those defections, um, what, 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 what's that going to look like moving forward? Yeah, I wouldn't count on defections and I wouldn't count on a split in the military. So this is compared to all other Southeast Asian militaries, this is not a military that splits. And um, the prior three coup, coups d'etat, uh, 
1968, were actually partially driven by faction factionalism in the military, in which the commander in chief comes out on top every single time, um, and whoever is is creating trouble ends up out of the military and off in another country as an attache. Um, so um, I know that uh, the protesters are, and, and I see on social media, there's a really serious debate about how to create a safe way out for soldiers and officers. Um, based on, on some of the interviews, uh, a handful of defectors have, have given saying, you know, that they were, there's nowhere to go if you defect, right? I mean, there's no place in the economy for you. I mean, the economy is completely decimated. Um, and there's almost no place that the military isn't going to hunt you down. Um, so, uh, it, it really is unlikely. Um, you know, there's a lot of hope in February because some of the police joined the joyful protests. Um, but these were not the combat police. These were not the riot police. These were community police. And I think to date, we've got fewer than 100 police who have joined uh, the resistance um, out of 55,000. So, you know, I think the protesters that I've been speaking to on, on Signal, encrypted app, um, right now they, they say that they will win via three things. One is that the good hearted souls in the military will put an end to this. And I think the military socialization process and uh, the incentive structure really rules against a military split. Uh, being politically significant. The second thing they're hoping for is uh, uh, responsibility to protect intervention from the international community. I think that's very unlikely to happen. And then the third thing they expect or hope will bring an end to this hunter, ver this version of a hunter role um, is that the ethnic armed organizations uh, in the more remote parts of the country will come to save the center of the country. And I think that's complicated and problematic for a whole lot of reasons. Um, and so, you know, what I do see happening over the long haul is just ongoing urban and rural uh, guerrilla warfare, just continuing uh, to dog uh, 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 whatever comes out of this. Um, I think so many people know how to make weapons now um, that, that can, can just uh, foil um, the, the military's ability to uh, realize this preposterous theater uh, that they're putting on every day in state media. I'm getting um, a number of questions that are following up on exactly this theme of what um, what are people on the ground doing, what internationally people can do to undermine the military's preposterous demonstration of power. Um, Russia and China have blocked UN Security Council resolutions, but um, as my colleague Dan Slater has says, they don't seem particularly enamored with uh, military uh, authoritarianism and especially instability. Um, yeah. The Chinese government, or excuse me, the Japanese government has poured, you know, ten billion dollars into the economy, not enamored. Um, to what extent can local resistance or international targeted sanctions um, decrease Chinese Russian support for the military, uh, undermine their ability to, to, to maintain dominance? So to be honest, I don't think Russia cares, um, but China does. So China has um, had developed a uh, fairly dominant position in Myanmar um, under the Aung San Suu Kyi led NLD government. Um, you know, having uh, signed Myanmar up to the Belt and Road, although um, Myanmar 
really did push back and slow all of that kind of stuff down. Um, I think much, uh, much is unknown about what is going to happen um, along, I mean, that Myanmar's border with China is the longest land border in Southeast Asia with China. Um, and China wants no part of, of refugees coming across that border. They've even shut down the most lucrative border crossing, Reili Muse. Um, and they've got soldiers all along them. Um, and uh, so um, I don't know how things are gonna play out. I mean, I, I would guess that um, the military might go back to its playbook of 1989 when it was facing the need to pacify the center and decided to pull its troops back from uh, the border regions by concluding ceasefire uh, agreements, uh, giving uh, considerable economic advantages uh, to former armed groups at, uh, to hold territory. I think that we might see the groups in the North, which have long kind of served China's interest in keeping a buffer between instability in other parts of the country and China's uh, border. Um, we might see those groups in the North uh, conclude ceasefires uh, with, um, with uh, a military junta, which would mean that the groups in the Southern part of the country, like the New Mon State Party and the Korean National Union would really be the odd man out. Um, uh, I mean, they, they may find, them, we may see yet another flipping of the conflict map as we saw in, in uh, the last 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, I, and I think China probably holds the key to whether uh, uh, those ceasefires happen or not, because they have considerable influence with the United Wa State Army, um, which is 30,000 uh, soldiers and uh, uh, a, an army uh, that is not one that the Tamadol wants to take on. It, just to clarify, you're saying that um, peace treaties with some armed ethnic organizations might um, might serve the interests of the Tatmadaw that might make for greater stability rather than seeing those organizations back the resistance? Yes, yeah, so not peace treaties because peace requires a political settlement, but ceasefires, an agreement to stop fighting each other and to allow the armed group uh, some economic concessions, like perhaps border crossing taxation, uh, perhaps uh, 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 mining rights uh, in the resource rich uh, areas along the border. Um, uh, all sorts of uh, possibilities in terms of trade routes. Um, those things uh, were offered in 1989 and many groups took advantage of them, and that allowed the Tamara to uh, deploy its troops uh, to rebuild the collapsed uh, socialist state um, with its own soldiers, because it pulled the, pulled, uh, the army back uh, from long standing conflict in the border areas. But I mean, this is a big if. I mean, I am not sure that the personnel in place around the commander in chief have um, the kind of gravitas that the head of military intelligence in 1989, General Kenyon had. Um, and I don't know that he delegates uh, that kind of thing and he can't possibly uh, maneuver on all of these fronts at the same time. Thank you for the clarification. One more clarification. I think we're going to wrap up because it's late um, in Bangkok and uh, you've been working really hard, Mary. Um, yeah. So 
Uh, on the international issue, I asked about China and Russia. Um, I briefly mentioned targeted sanctions from the US. Oh, yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk of ASEAN too playing some role in uh, sort of negotiated settlements of sort of off ramp from civil war. What are your thoughts there? Very unlikely. I mean, there is an upcoming ASEAN summit that is uh, aimed at focusing on the Myanmar crisis. Um, but like, who in ASEAN right now isn't? devastated by COVID and, and economic crisis. Um, who wants to make an enemy of the Myanmar commander in chief? Certainly, I think the prime minister of Thailand doesn't. Um, and, um, you know, the rest of ASEAN is doesn't really have any leverage uh, in Myanmar. So, um, and in terms of, you know, sanctions from either, I mean, they've been uh, raised as a possibility in Malaysia. Um, you know, I, I, I think the response of the military would be, we've dealt with sanctions before, we'll get through this. China will continue to buy all of our natural resources and Thailand will continue to pay us for our natural gaps. And with that, they can, can just continue on as long as um, China and Russia don't uh, uh, abandon them. I, um, I think it's, this has been a hard conversation. This yeah, is an, an important conversation. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in that we're not unfortunately going to get to uh, because I think we've asked enough of you, Mary. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, your empathy, your insight. It's truly invaluable. Um, and it, the, the, the praise for you in the chat is just coming in uh, like a waterfall. So thank you everyone for your participation, especially to Mary and um, uh, I hope we take seriously the suggestions for solidarity, for continuing to pay attention, uh, even though sometimes that can be hard, um, especially those of us with privilege. Uh, there's an opportunity for uh, meaningful engagement and support. Uh, so I would urge everyone to do that. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining.